Amen. Amen. Let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 7. That's where we're going to be at. We're going to look at verses 11 through 29, the end of this chapter. And we're continuing our series here in this book. And tonight, we're going to be thinking on this thought, things we need to get a hold of. Proverbs 4, verses 5 through 7 tell us, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall pres preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Now, as we go through these verses tonight, there is some standard equipment. I think that Solomon is wanting us to see, he's wanting us to look at, and every person needs these things in their life to make sense of things when things do happen in our life and they come across our path. And Solomon is telling us what that equipment is. He's telling us what these things are. And he says, we need to take hold of these things and, and not let go. He's saying, hold them, embrace them. Don't, don't let them go because these things are very important. These things are so important to help you when things happen to you in life that just don't make sense. And so we're going to look at these in the first uh, series of verses here. We're going to look at verses 11 through 15. But we're going to look at wisdom's buckler. This is point number one. So let's start here in verse number 11. It says, Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight, which he hath made crooked? In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider, God also hath set the one over against the other, to the end that man should find nothing after him. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Now, what in the world is this word buckler that we're talking about here? Well, buckler, in the biblical sense, is portrayed as a portable shield. It was used for a defense, and wisdom, which... Solomon is talking about here is for our defense. It's for us to use when things happen to us to use wisdom in such a way that it helps us. As we see here in verse number 11, we see that an inheritance without wisdom is not good. Why is that? He's talking about it will be wasted and make a person worse off than before that they actually got the inheritance. I've seen many people that have gotten inheritance when someone passed away and they left them a, a large sum of money and they've squandered it all. And why is that? Because they did not seek wisdom in how to actually use the inheritance that they were given and they were granted due to the circumstances. But also, just as money is a defense against physical want, now we know money... That almighty green stuff that we have in our wallets and our purses. It pays for doctors. It pays for that good food that we get, that food that we eat. It pays for the clothing. Yeah, just as money is a defense against physical want, wisdom is a protection against emotional problems, against wasting life and its opportunities. That's what he says here in verse 12. For wisdom is a defense... And money is a defense, but the excellency, that's important what he's speaking about here, the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Now, there's many people that have 
bukus. You ever heard that word bukus of money? A lot of money. But they don't have wisdom in how to use it. We've talked about this before. People that have had sums of money have been granted sums of money who have had all this money come into their fold but have squandered it because they did not seek wisdom. They did not seek the wise decisions that maybe some people had poured into them. But also, wisdom will keep you alive when you don't have money. That's what he's talking about here in verse number 12. It says, wisdom is that that giveth life to them that have it. To seek wisdom. This is what is so important about it. But also, wisdom considers what God is doing and doesn't try to undo it. Verse number 13 again. Consider the work of God. For who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? Now, there's some things in life that just cannot be fixed. You think about a a river that is crooked. I mean, you personally, you, you can't fix that. That's just something that God made to be the way that it is. Um, oftentimes, there's people that we have in life people that we meet, people that we want to change. You ever wanted to try to change somebody? Oh, man. There's been many that have sat across from me and I've talked to. And oh, how I wish that I could have made the decisions for them. This has been back years and years ago when I was a youth pastor and I would sit there and I'd listen to a teenager telling me, Oh, this, oh, that. And then hear from their parents about how they were disobedient. How they were walking down a path toward the destruction. And oh, how I wish I could just go and make the decisions for them. Oh, how I wish I could change them. But the fact of the matter is, you know what we got to do? We got to stop trying to change them. We need to pray for them. The only one that can change a heart is the one that can break a heart, and that's God. That's the only one that can make the difference here, and only God can straighten them out. And this is what Psalm is talking about here. Just leave it to God. That's what wisdom is. Stop trying to do the work of God. Leave the work of God to the one that only can do it, and that's God. He's the only one that can do those things. But also, verses 14 and 15 Wisdom will help you to evaluate circumstances so that you will know how to respond in certain situations. Verse 14 and 15 again. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider God also has set the one over against the other to end that man should find nothing after him. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Now, wisdom will help you to evaluate circumstances. You will know how to respond. Enjoying the day, or, or excuse me, join the day of prosperity. Reflect in the day of adversity. Be submissive because God is regulating the affairs of life. Oftentimes, I've heard people say, "Well, God's just not fair." If you won't really want fair. All of us deserve to die and go to hell. That's what fair is. So don't tell me that God's not being fair. I'm just so thankful that He loved me enough that He made it possible for me to have a relationship with Him. And that's Jesus. So God also allows good days and bad days because He wants us to learn to trust Him instead of circumstances. I have heard, and this really just makes the hair stand up on my neck and makes me kind of just go, ooh, when I hear someone say this. Oh, if you'll only trust in Jesus, if you'll only trust in Jesus, all your problems will go away and you'll never have to face anything ever again. I've heard people actually say that. That is such a misleading and unbiblical statement. Now, when we trust in Jesus, we're forever secure. Praise God for that. 
And regardless of what comes down our path, nothing can take our salvation away from us. However, there will still be good days and there will still be bad days. Why is that? Because God uses the bad to teach us. He uses the good to teach us. And this is what he's talking about here. God allows good days and bad days because he wants us to learn to trust him. And that's part of wisdom. But also there are some things you just have to trust God about because there is no human answer whatsoever. You ever ran across something that just bewildered you? Left you puzzled? Well, there's been times I've sat and I've pondered and I've thought, I cannot fathom what this really means. <laughs> Or what this is, why this is happening, I just cannot contemplate it. I just don't have an answer for it. But there's some things, when they happen to you, you simply just have to trust God. You do. Now, is that easy? No. But I promise you, if you do, He'll hold your hand and He'll walk you through it. He will help you through whatever circumstance that that is. Sometimes there's this no human answer. Um, I like what it says here, see, verse 22 and 23. Let's skip ahead just a moment and then we'll come back. For oftentimes also thine own heart knowest that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. For all this I proved my wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. See, it's interesting sometimes when You see someone that lives for the Lord. Example, my mom. She lived for the Lord, was faithful, was enjoyed, or involved in a ministry with the Southern Baptist Convention called the WMU, the Women's Missionary Union. Um, I think it's called WOM now, Women on Mission. That's what they call it now, I think. I'm pretty confident about that. But my mom was... Faithful, came to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, helped cook, helped mentor many young women in the church, helped in vacation Bible school, did all those things. And then at the age of 50, she found out she had a brain tumor, died one year later. 51 years old, she left to go into eternity to be with Jesus. Okay, she, she lived for the Lord. I mean, she walked faithfully with Him. And for someone like that to leave so early, it's puzzling. Like, why? It's puzzling, isn't it? Some people that perish, that live righteous lives. Missionary David Bernard died in his 20s serving on the mission field. A very young individual who was faithful to the Lord. And it leaves you puzzled thinking... And then, on the flip side of that, you see wicked individuals that live wicked lives. We think about Manasseh was the most wicked king Israel had ever seen. The longest reign. And he lived a long life and was wicked. Puzzling isn't about why that someone would be allowed to live so long. Atheist George Bernard Shaw mocked the Bible, was considered a very devout atheist, lived to be the age of 95. But then on the flip side of that, you see people that live for the Lord, that their lives have been cut short maybe by something that happened. I don't have an answer for you on that. Possibly, just me thinking, with no really concrete confidence In this, just me thinking out loud here, maybe the length of life of someone that's wicked is so that hopefully they will trust in Jesus one day. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not so sure on that, okay? But it's puzzling when you think about that. And this is what Solomon's talking about here. There's just some things you have to trust God about because there's no human answer because we are limited in our thinking. But look at what it says. This is interesting in chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. We're skipping ahead just a chapter here because I want to read these verses, then we'll come back. Solomon says, Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, 
And his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. Now, for someone whose life's been cut short, and they were young and they lived for the Lord, I can almost imagine they'd rather have had that to have lived a long life of wickedness to know that that was the end. Because a person that lives wicked and has not trusted in Jesus and has not pursued wisdom, it is an end. It's one that has not feared the Lord. But here we see wisdom will help you to evaluate circumstances so you know how to pursue. So first of all, Solomon tells us that we need to grasp, to take hold of wisdom's buckler. Use this as the defense. Use this in such a way that it helps you along life's life. But then also number two is he speaks about wisdom's balance. Balance. Uh, Verse 16 through 18, we'll read these and then we'll touch on them again individually. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Thy shouldest thou die before thy time. It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Also from this withdraw not thine hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. What's Solomon speaking of here? I think he's saying to beware of extremes and excesses. Verse number 16, being righteous over much means thinking at times that we are possibly more righteous than we truly are. He said, be careful about this. It is a warning against religious conceit. What is he saying? Well... In Jesus' time, there was a group called the Pharisees, and I think he is saying, do not be a Pharisee. Look what it says here in Romans 10, verses 1 through 3. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Of God. Then Romans eleven twenty five, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. And then Romans twelve three, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. See, a person that has a super spiritual, a self-wise lifestyle begins to become very harsh at times, intolerant, and will begin to sit in judgment of others if they're not careful. And boy, I've met several of those. Someone walk in, being very critical, being very judgmental about maybe the way that they've dressed, and I've touched on this before in sermons. Hey, if they walk in here with something inappropriate on their shirt, and it's happened where I've pastored and I've preached before, I've seen people walk in with beer shirts on, okay? And oftentimes people will get real offended. Oh, look, they have a Budweiser shirt on. Oh, look, they've got some type of shirt on that's inappropriate. Hey, I'm not worried about the shirt. I'm worried about them, the individual. And I'm just thankful that they're actually here. Let's not get so wrapped up in the material things that we lose sight of the spiritual things because that soul is what is important. And we want him here. We want him to be there to hear the truth. One person has once said this, and I like this quote, and I may have mentioned it before. I'm sure I have. A Pharisee is hard on others but easy on self. A Christian, however... Is hard on self and easy on others. We got to learn. This is what Solomon is talking about here to find that balance. But verse number 17, he's saying, This is not a license to sin here. What he's talking about in verse number 17, 
Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? He's not saying this is a license to actually be wicked because being overly wicked will shorten a person's life. There is a danger of crossing the line of sin unto death. There's been many who have stepped over that line, who have lived a wicked life, going out to possibly drink. I've heard of many stories of teenagers who have drank under the age and went out on a night and they crashed a vehicle. I know growing up, my brother, my oldest brother, there was a football player that he had on his team. He was a star quarterback. And one night I think that he was involved in an automobile accident. I think there was another person that was actually drinking, was behind the wheel, crashed, hit that tree, dead. All because of a decision to do something that they knew they shouldn't be doing. But many people's lives have been ended short because of being involved in something wicked they knew they should not have been involved with. And it's sad. Almost every year, almost every school year, I hear of situations pop up where students have passed away due to some situation they were involved with that they never should have been involved with to begin. And it's sad. It it breaks your heart. But there is a danger of crossing the line of sin unto death. But also the balanced man, the balanced individual, is the one who fears the Lord and doesn't lose touch with everything else. This is verse 18. It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thy hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Feareth the Lord. Trust in Him. In the long run, even though the person looks like they're not the coolest, and I know this is terminology, maybe it'd be a good lesson for some teenagers to sit in front and talk about. Even though it's not the coolest, even though it's not the hippest, even though it's not the most popular thing to do, if you still fear the Lord and walk righteously before Him, you will still come out the best on the end. Don't fall prey for those things that will pull you down. And that's what he's speaking about here with wisdom's balance is beware of extremes and excesses. Not to be such an individual that is so tied in such a way of being critical, but finding that balance that he's talking about. Then number three is wisdom's benefits. Let's look here at um, verse number 19 first. It says, Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. See, the strength over the expertise of ten men. See, with all men's might, no one is perfect. Look what it says in verse number 20. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Wow. A short list here as we look through the Bible. Noah. He feared the Lord. He built the ark amongst the laughter of the people that thought he was crazy. They had never seen rain come from the sky. And he said that the world will be flooded. Now the canopy theory, the canopy that came and gave moisture to the ground, that gave them the vegetation, that's how they had their food. That's how they had everything that they had. But he preached and he said, it's coming. And his sons helped him to build this ark. And can you imagine the laughter? The mocking. You're a crazy man. You know, it would have been easy to have said, I think they're right. But he continued to build. But even with him walking and fearing the Lord, still Noah was one that had sin. And why is that? Because Noah, after it all happened, after they had come to land, Noah actually got drunk. And we know that what happened with that story. Moses got angry. What? Yeah, Moses got upset. David, the one that feared the Lord, the one that slew the giant, 
The one that killed the bear. The one that did all these things. He was up on a rooftop. And he looked down and what happened? He lusted. He committed adultery and then also he committed murder. Peter cursed and denied. Cursed and then he denied thrice the Lord. Thomas doubted. I mean, one of the disciples doubted. Unless I can see the nail scar hand. He was the doubter there. Poor old Elijah. We know what happened with him. He got so upset, he pouted underneath a juniper tree. Cried like a big baby. But with all men's might, when I say men, I'm talking about all the people in all their might, nobody is perfect. Even the ones in the Bible who followed after the Lord, they were still individuals that had what? A sin problem. We all do. One preacher said this, When I pray, I sin. When I preach, I sin. My very repentance needs to be repented of, and my tears need washing in the blood of Christ. That is because most of my tears are shed in self-pity. But he's saying here there's the benefits of wisdom, but also wisdom teaches an individual how to respond to the criticism of others. Ooh. We don't like to be criticized, do we? I know I don't. But being in a leadership position and over the years, and there's times that I get criticized and I just got to learn, like I said, I think last week is I've got to have that height of a rhinoceros. Remember, if you're going to be a pastor, you got to have the heart like Jesus, the mind of a scholar, and the hide of a rhinoceros. So a rhinoceros hide's pretty thick. But wisdom teaches you how to respond to the criticism of others. Look at verse 21 and 22. Also, take no heed upon unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise has cursed others. What's he saying here? Well, I think he is warning against eavesdropping. That could be one thing. But also, don't be concerned or anxious about what others are saying about you or anyone else. And you know, we are possibly all more than likely, not possibly, more than likely, all guilty of that. Because when we hear someone said something about us, you know what we'll want to do? We want to go ask them, say, could you tell me what they said? I want to know. And I want to know what they got to say about me. Was it good? Was it bad? What was it? What did they have to say? But don't be so concerned or anxious about what others are saying about you or anyone else. Um, because more than likely, if you find out, you'll want to know more. And then what it creates in your mind, it's like a process. You find out someone said something about you, you find out it's not good, it makes you upset, and then you get upset at the person. And then you know what happens? Oftentimes they don't go talk to them about it because you don't want to get the other person in trouble. So then you go wandering around trying to avoid them. Hey, I know how this works because I've had people tell me about it. Okay? But this is part of it. That's why he's telling us here, just don't be so concerned about those things. But then verse 22, that verse that we just read, For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. And what does this mean? There's been times that we've told other people what we don't like about someone too. You know the old saying, what's good for the goose is good for the what? Gander. So if someone's criticizing you, and you don't like what they're saying about you, more than likely you've criticized someone and they may have told someone else that you were criticizing what you said. So it just goes around. What comes around goes around. It's just round and round. So that's why it's always care. That's why it's so important to always be careful about what you say. Always. Um, I'm more of a... I have to really allow something to saturate before I make a response. Especially... I'm not the type of person if someone confronts me that I just go, bah, 
You know, sometimes people just, they, if they're confronted and they're, someone says something, they'll just blurt back out without actually thinking or saying anything. And maybe that's good in a way. Maybe it's good to be punctual and say something. I'm not that type of person. I like to think through things, especially important things. But it's so important that we be careful about what we say. Um, also, some things cannot be found out. Look what he says here in verses 23 through 25. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. I think that goes back to what we were talking about. Some things just cannot be found out. We'll never know. Um, there's some things that we'll never know about why people do the evil, wicked things that they do. Um, there's been times where people have been on death row who have committed just horrible, horrible, just murders, have went out and uh, cold-blooded murder, just killed people. And never an answer. Never an answer why. And... and and, and some things just will never be found out. And that leaves families with a lot of questions and leaves a hole there because they're thinking, why? Why did this person choose to do that? Why did they have that happen in their life? Um, Romans 11 verses 33 through 34 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgment and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor? Even the things of God that He does, even the things of God that are permitted to happen and happen in life, it's baffling. Um, in 6,000 plus years of human history, okay, I'm a young earth creationist, so I believe the world's just a little over 6,000 years old. I'm a, I've always been a young earth creationist. There is still no answer to the problems of famine, crime, war, religious disunity, and sin. And regardless of how people try to find these answers, there's still going to be more questions about why things happen. But Solomon is on a quest. You ever heard of that before? I am on a quest to find what I'm looking for. Um, sometimes I'm on a quest when I've lost something. I, I I tell Kendra, I tell Titus, Miriam, I said, I am going to find this regardless of what I got to do. And oftentimes if it's something small, boy, I'll get that flashlight out. And I'll go looking. And she said, you ever going to give up? And I said, never. I'm never giving up. I'm going to find what I am looking for. It's going to be found. So, but Solomon is on a quest to know and find wisdom. That's what he's talking about here. Notice what his findings are. Wisdom will keep you, and this is an important verse for her, and this is nothing against any woman in particular, okay? But here in verse number 26, he says, And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands as bands, whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Now, a question for you. Do you think this is an experience he had with a woman? Several? Do you think he's writing here and he remembers several that he had these experiences with? Do you think that? But he's saying here that wisdom will keep you from the entrapments of a wicked woman. That's what he's saying here. Look what it says here in Proverbs 7, verses 4 through 5. Uh-oh, let me flip to it there. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, seven and five. I may not have given those to you. I'm sorry. Am up on the screen? <laughs> Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. What, what is he saying here? I, I think really this is a personal experience that he had. Um, and I think that him being a man, 
And the beauty of the women, I mean, because there was many. No telling how many women that he was involved with. There's probably several that were pretty rough around the edges and maybe did some things that stuck with him more than the others. Very possible reason why he could have written this here and recorded that there. Um, But also, look what it says here in verse 27 and 28. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher. Remember, quoheleth, that's that Hebrew word. Refers to himself as the preacher. Counting one by one to find out the account. Which yet my soul keepeth, but I find not one man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. So men with real wisdom he's talking about is a rarity, about one in a thousand, and it is even rarer among women. Now, it's interesting because you think, is he being a little biased here with what he's writing? I mean, it maybe leads you to think that. But do you possibly think this is just because of the experience that he had? Yeah, yeah. That's why he's recording it. Yeah. (laughs) No, no. Yeah. You know, I read this and it's very easy to think, okay, he, he is obviously writing this, but as he's writing, and we know the Bible is inspired, I believe it's inspired Genesis through Revelation, all things are God-breathed. In this instance, like you were talking about, is this a personal experience that he had? And that when I was reading this, I was thinking too, just trying to get in that mindset that, Yeah, he's had these experiences because of the women that he was entangled with, that he was involved with. And so that's interesting that he points this out. And yes, he was not very wise because of being attracted and wanting that desire, or not really the desire, but wanting to have so many women in his life caused so many different problems. And uh, to be wise and to be that individual, that was a, a, a big mistake. But what did Solomon find in his search for wisdom? Well, yeah, God made man right, but after man sinned, he is always coming up with new ways and inventions to sin. Look what it says here in verse 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright... But they have sought out many inventions. And when you look at inventions, that is new ways to break and fall away from God. So that's what Solomon found when he's seeking out for wisdom. And that's what he comes to the conclusion of, is that even individuals that are just can sin. And that's what we touched on earlier. Any thoughts, anything that touched on, that we touched on that you got a question about? (laughs) Hey, reading that, that would be easy because I thought to myself, wow, I mean, he's, it's almost like he's sharing a personal experience here is what he's recording here. Because who knows how many situations that make him think about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he got him a he got him a good one, yeah. This, but as you're thinking about it, though, it's it's as I was studying, as I reread this, it's very obvious that th- 
this is some experience or many that he encountered. And this is what he's talking about. Um, because it doesn't matter who you are. If you are involved in that many of the opposite sex, obviously, you're going to encounter somebody that's going to be a bad one and is going to do things that is going to hurt you, is going to offend you. So um, that's what he's talking about here. But wisdom, yeah, but wisdom, when, when you seek it, it, it's it's hard sometimes to embrace because often we want to do things our way, and I've heard many that have said that. Um, but if you only seek wisdom, it would keep you out of so many difficult situations and so many heartbreaks, I think. Um, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a that's a good question, though. I think that eventually down the line, um, man just become more wicked, and more wicked, and that just took on and and yeah. Well, you think about the trouble that it creates. I mean, think about just for a moment, Abraham and Sarah. Sarah couldn't what? Okay, so. To find a way to get a child, Hagar was offered and then Ishmael was born. And what happened immediately? Sarah got so mad and jealous. And that was just due to trying to create something and get, a, get ahead of God is what that was. And so um, as man progressed and as history went on, it just got more wicked, more wicked. And then you come to this point with co concubines and, and there's no telling how many women Solomon had. I mean, we can only speculate, really. Um, but at the same time, though, that's not the order God wants. I mean, just like, well, Mormons <laughs> believe in having more. And so, but that's not the order of God. I mean, the, the covenant of marriage before God is for one man and one woman, period. And for, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got to think about that was a different type of custom, too, during that time. So it's hard. It's once again, you'd only be speculating, really, on what all happened with that. I mean, who knows how many separations and how many women went out and talked bad about him, and uh, there's no telling. I mean, that, and that's what he's talking about here, all these bad situations. I mean, if he would have only have sought wisdom, it would have saved him from that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to think about, I know, but that's what he's, the whole thing he's getting to, though, is his search for wisdom and what he found. And that's this whole thing is just his recording, his reflection on his journey in pursuing that which is obviously under the sun and only above the sun is where true meaning is found. And I know sometimes it seems like it gets a little redundant, but it is. He's just seeking and he's looked and he's sought. He's, he's looked between... Underneath every rock. I mean, literally, he's looked under every rock. He's went behind every bush. He's looked in every spot that he thinks has not been searched. And he's looked and sought for the meaning. And this is what his reflection is. That's what he's recorded here. And he, he did it all. 
I mean, we think we do a lot, but he's probably lived more many time lifetimes of searching than we've ever thought of searching because he really pursued it. Look at me. Yes. Yeah. No, no. But this book represents a transparency of of just what he did in his search. Yeah. If they're saved and they've been led by the Spirit and they're following the leadership of the Spirit. I would think so. Because on the flip side of that, would it be unwise to not follow the leadership of the Lord if you're saved? I mean, you'd want to be in harmony with what the Lord and what the Holy Spirit says and speaks unto you. Someone once quoted this to me, and I, I don't recall the verse off the top of my head. Maybe someone would know, and this just came to me, to be as wise as, you know the verse I'm talking about, to be as wise as a, and be as, yeah, yeah. What's the verse? You, wise as a fox or gentle as a dove. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the verse. <laughs> yeah, 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 and I, I can't recall what verse, yeah, 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 <laughs> but to me, but to me like wise, just be, be smart, be smart about things, oh yeah, Behold, I send you forth to be sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, that's the verse. I couldn't recall what it was. Um, and harmless as a dove. Someone had actually quoted this to me that was giving me some advice. on, um, and, and they were telling me that just to remember this verse when you're dealing with something, that to always be wise and, and to um, always make certain you're, you're covering your bases, doing what you need to do. And it's just like for me, I'll, I'll be transparent with you. When, when I meet with people and I meet with a lady, regardless of how old, how young, I always have another person present with me. And it's just because it's another person of the opposite sex. And I always do that. That's just to save me. And I've been taught over the years that's just being wise to do that. And so um, there's just things that I've been told over the years that if you're going to be in ministry, you, you just got to be wise about it and make good decisions. And, um, and harmless as, as dove, I mean, just that speaks volumes. I mean, a dove's not harm, is, is harmless, and, and you need to present yourself in that type of way. So, all right, any other question? Anything? Uh, Fox? <laughs> That's right. You're thinking of that verse. Yeah. I, this was the verse. I couldn't think of the actual text, the reference, but... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just to be, I mean, as you, it, the verse says, I'll send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise. Why would you want to be wise when you're going forth? as sheep into the midst of wolves, because the wolves are there to what? Yes, and also to deceive. So you've got to be wise, but also you've got to keep about yourself that harmless spirit. 
So you can't go in like a wrecking ball, but you've also got to be wise. You've got to be very, um, yeah, firm. So anyways, we jump way off on that one. So <laughs> we walked, we went off the pirates, the, we went off the plank on that one. <laughs> Possums aren't too wise. <laughs> But I'll tell you what, though, you ever seen a possum hiss, though? Ooh. Well, they'll fight. Yeah, yeah. Funny story, and then we'll pray. <laughs> Thinking about possums, I had used to have two basset hounds, and uh, my dad, he was a big coon hunter. He used to go coon hunting and stuff, and he had these little cages. He'd catch raccoons and possums. But anyway, he's up next to his barn. He used to catch, like, raccoons. But anyway, he caught a possum, and he come over there, and... I just thought raccoons were mad. That thing was hissing, and that my basset hound ran over there. He was just a puppy. He went over there and barked, and I thought that possum was going to bite that, ca- rip that cage to shreds trying to get out of there. I mean, those things are mean. I mean, they're they're not wise. They'll do crazy, dumb things, but they're very mean. Yeah. So, anyways, we went way off with that too. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you guys so much. Let's stand. Let's pray. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's right. There we go. You don't want to stick your finger in there. He'll bite it and have it for lunch. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Thank you guys so much for being here. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time together this evening. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. And thank you that we can have the time to dig into it, reflect, discuss. And we pray for safety tonight as we travel home. And we pray, looking forward to this Sunday, pray that you be honored and glorified through everything that's said and done. Thank you. Once again, for eternal life through Jesus, your Son, and ask all this in His name. Amen.